My name is Mark Boxer, and I, um, among various hats, run all communications and media for um, both the Varki Foundation and GEMS Education, so it fell to me uh, the honor of interviewing... Um, you got the short straw. <laughs> straw. You got an, an, a British icon, uh, oh. Sir Martin Sorrell, and we are honored to have him here with us. Um, Sir Martin, as all of you know, is the CEO of WPP. Um, he is a product of um, some of the finest education institutions in the world. Uh, haberdashers. You're school. biased. <laughs> you're, you're biased. Uh, you have a vested interest. Or so your dad has a vested interest. We should explain uh, on the grounds of transparency that he is the son, this makes me feel really old, <laughs> of a classmate of mine at uh, business school. So when you're being so interviewed by yeah. uh, the sons of someone you're Th at school this with. This is a sign that it's time <laughs> to go. So, uh, so Martin uh, went to Cambridge University um, and then to Harvard Business School, uh, was at Saatchi and Saatchi, uh, as many of you know, and then um, acquired uh, WPP, which was not an advertising it's company. Wire time. and plastic products. For the Wire and to plastic. totally confuse everyone. <laughs> yeah. And uh, turned it into the largest advertising company in the world. Yes, but a bit more than advertising, but communication, broadly, that would media. Do as, that would suffice as an explanation. Yes, advertising, media. So we have, uh, for example, here in Dubai, uh, probably about a dozen operations, which we spent yesterday um, going through. Uh, so we have in, in, the, in the MENA region, so our revenues are about uh, $20 billion. Our billings, uh, being somebody of challenged uh, uh, stature, I like to talk about big numbers. So I, I, or the bigger the numbers I talk about, the better it is. So 80 billion uh, of uh, billings. Uh, in this in this market here, we have about a billion dollars of billing, and we have about um, in MENA region, we're about five thousand people, and revenues about five hundred million dollars. So about five hundred million dollars in the Middle East and North Africa, another five hundred million dollars in South Africa and Sub-Saharan. So the, our, our African and Middle Eastern businesses are about a billion dollars out of the twenty, so about five percent, probably about about market rate uh, weighting, probably GNP weighting. We're over-indexed in the US and the UK, as you would expect, because the UK is where we started. We're under-indexed in China, although it's our third largest business and we have uh, 16,000 people there, and we're under-indexed in Japan, and we can discuss whether it's good to be under-indexed in Japan or not. So that's roughly, so we're third US, a third Western Europe, including the UK, and the third the more exciting, my view, the more exciting parts of the world, including this, uh, the I Asia, Latin America, Africa, Middle East, and Central Eastern Europe. How many employees worldwide? 190,000 in 112 wow. countries. The 112th wow. was Cuba. We have, our, we have our man in Havana, a man, not a woman, uh, and we're starting to develop um, our business there with the government, obviously. And then in addition to that, uh, we're looking very closely at Iran. Um, and we're on the cusp of doing a number of things in Iran. In fact, actually, uh, re having reviewed our, our businesses here in the region uh, yesterday, uh, it's probably top of the agenda about how, how we open up and expand in Iran. I mean, it's 80 million people, 83 million. So this is the last market, big market to open up, really. Uh, well, some say since the fall of the Soviet Union, since the fall of the wall or the fall of the wall and the, the, the end of the, quotes unquote, the Cold War. Um, it rivals Vietnam. Vietnam's about 80 million people. Myanmar, where we did go in after s sanctions were lifted, uh, we now have about uh, 200 people in Myanmar with representing about six of our businesses, so small scale. Uh, but that was 60 million people. So this is, uh, you know, this is a big thing commercially. Um, it's, uh, it's uh, I, I'll say this, um, it's, uh, I'm sort of ambivalent about it because uh, I'm Jewish um, and uh, from a personal point of view, I find it very difficult to um, come to terms with the fact that the state of Iran still uh, would like to wipe, uh, well, uh, <laughs> according to one or two individuals at least, would like to wipe Israel off the face of the map. So, uh, you know, I'd like to see resolution of that issue, uh, but looking at, at it coldly as a uh, commercial issue, 
or a commercial opportunity, obviously it's a major opportunity. And large numbers of our clients uh, are looking or are on the cusp of uh, doing things there. So, so you know, it's it's uh, the world is a, a, a difficult place at the moment, and Iran, in a way, is uh, a little bit of a beacon of light, uh, subject to the qualifications I've just great. made. You've outlined wonderfully the sheer scale and complexity of both the world, yeah. but also WPP's operation. I've, yeah. I've got a quote for you, if you remember this. The 21st century is not a place for tidy minds. Yes, I think it's true. So we're at the Global Education it's and Skills It's probably more forum. true now <laughs> than <laughs> it was said, because uh, no, I think that's uh, become even true. The black swans, uh, we don't know about. The gray swans, as we call them, uh, there are many of them. And some are getting whiter, some are getting darker. Uh, the black ones are the ones you have to watch out for because they're the ones you, by definition, you don't know. But I do. I, I think that's still. I, I, I hadn't remembered that uh, for some time, but I think that's even more true now. So when you think about what kind of minds we need for the 21st century, this yeah. is a skills forum. What What do you think we need? Um, well, you know, it's very difficult for me me to say because I came from a very narrow. I mean, if I think about um, my British education. It was extremely narrow. It's top of my mind, actually, because I went to, uh, by coincidence, I went to a school called Seven Oaks School uh, just this week, and I talked to the sixth formers there. Uh, it, it, it Seven Oaks is quite interesting because it's mixed school, thousand students, private school. Uh, it's one of the only schools in the UK to do the IB, the yep. baccalaureate. Yep. Uh, so. The kids there, if I can call them kids, young men and young women, um, have a much broader education. That, so when I, from the age of, uh, let me just get it right now, from the age of 16 or 15 and a half, to be precise, I specialized in the arts and not the sciences. So I did uh, geography, history, and economics at A-level. For those of you uh, with a British background, uh, I got six A-levels, right? But I didn't get six A-levels because I was outstandingly intelligent, I wasn't. I got six A-levels because we did it at the Oxford and Cambridge joint, joint Board, and we did it at the University of London, and at Haberdashers, because you mentioned I went to Haberdashers, it was a good direct grant grammar school. Actually, interestingly, Haberdashers was a very interesting institution because the, there were these things called direct grant grammar schools, which had people from the, who were fee payers, and people who were state aided. And about, I think half of the school came from, were, were subsidized, uh, paid for, and half the school paid. My, my father paid a fee, would you believe, of 30 pounds, so about $50 a term, so $150 a year, whilst I was at Haberdasher, so I always, always remember that. But the great thing about the system was it took the best people from the state sector and the best people, what I call it the private sector, or fee paying, so it was a really outstanding Academic school had very high Oxbridge intake, which was a was a mark there. Not in the premier range of private schools or or mixed schools, but those direct grant grammar schools, Manchester Grammar was another one at the time. They were right up there with uh, at that time, I suppose, Winchester, Eton in the private sector, not so much Harrow, in the private sector in terms of things. But the e education was very narrow. So from four fi fifteen and a half. All I did was geography, history, economics. I got those extra three A-levels by doing it at University of London and studying British Constitution, economic history, and economic theory. So it was really four economics A-levels and two geography and history, but very narrow. The kids at, uh, at Seven Oaks, those young men and women, they have to take a language. They have to take a science subject. It has to be mixed. So you, you know, the, the, the woman that introduced me, the boy who, introduced, who gave the vote of thanks, a, a very, very mixed uh, education. Mine was very narrow. I then went to Cambridge and studied economics. And it's interesting, I never did uh, maths past O level. And therefore, I never did calculus. So when I got to Cambridge, uh, and I, I didn't select Christ College Cambridge, but I wanted to go to Christ College Cambridge because there was a welfare economist there, a, a Nobel Prize winner called James Mead. And I thought, you know, wonderful, I'll be at Cambridge and I will be taught by one of the finest economists in the world. In the three years I was at Cambridge, I never saw Professor Mead. 
right? <laughs> and this is really interesting because the, the, and this is not a criticism, but I guess it may come out as a criticism. They didn't teach. What they did was do research. And I was taught by a, a, a guy who turned out in the end to be a, a f quite a famous mathematical economist called Chris Bliss. He did my tutorials. You know, we had a tutorial every week, one on economic history, one on uh, economic theory. I could not understand a word of what he said for the three years. And, um, and the articles I used to read in economic theory or economics magazine, I could understand the first half, which was the words, but the maths bit at the end I was completely lost. So I sort of, um, I must say, I, I, the, the, the three years at Cambridge I loved, it's a, I think, the mo I'm biased, but I think it's the most beautiful university on earth. Not that I've seen everyone, so I can't say Oxford. that. But it is, yeah. Well, that's <laughs> that's in the middle of a city. Uh, but Cambridge is a market town. It's really a beautiful place, and a wonderfully re relaxed place to to study. But I, you know, I didn't make the best of it. I, I have to say. And then I went two years later, as you said, Mark, to uh, business school, and that was more my metier. I mean, Harvard Business School was then and still is a trade school. That is something that, you know, in the UK, in a sense, is a bad thing. Uh, not a bad thing, but sort of looked down a little bit. And of course, you and I were talking about the fact, because as I said, Mark's dad was in my class <laughs> at HBS. And um, the, we were on, we, uh, one of the, the little known facts is that, that Cambridge, that Harvard is not in Cambridge. Harvard Business School is not in Cambridge. It's on the other side of the river. It's on the Boston side of the river. And you often felt that you were, uh, uh, you know, in a different country. And the, the uh, academics on the Cambridge side of the river looked down, and they did look down. I mean, it, w it was on the, the trade school. Um, I, I was um, part of the class that Dean Athos, who was the admissions tutor at that time, described the most naive class at the Harvard Business School. And the reason we were the most naive class was that was at the time of the draft. I went straight from Cambridge to HBS. Um, I, I didn't do a job in between. Uh, the reason being that when I was about 15 years old, somebody had said to me, what do you want to do? And I said, please, it was a bit like the graduate, you know, the plastics thing. Uh, I said, please, sir, I want to go into business. And he said, well, my boy, if you want to go into business, the thing you must do is to go to Harvard Business School. And in 1964, when I was at the Democratic Convention, the Lyndon Johnson, one year after the assassination of JFK, when I, w I went up to Boston, uh, whilst I was at Ala in Atlantic City, I went up to Boston and went into the admissions uh, section office and said, you know, I'd like to come, filled in the application form. So, I, you know, it indicated I wanted to go. But tho those two years um, at HBS, trade school, very focused on career with people who were much more mature than me. The average age of that class was about 24 going in. That's why it was the most naive class probably one of the youngest classes ever. The average age now probably about 25, 26, 27. Uh, much more mature now. People haven't gone in. But that really, I think, uh, changed my direction. My mother said it was the worst thing that ever happened to me, interestingly. Why? I think because she, think she thought it made me too focused on um, career too focused on business. My father was a, a retailer. My father uh, died in uh, 1989, uh, but still, so a long time ago now, um, 25, 26, 27 years ago, but was, uh, you talk about mentors. You know, my father was my biggest mentor. Well, there will never be anybody. So I had a very, very close relationship with him to the extent that this was pre-mobile phones, that I would talk to him and this is not an exaggeration. I would talk to him every day, probably five, six, seven times a day. Even in the teeth, we, we, we have done, um, well, there's no such thing as a hostile takeover, but in 1987, we, we took W, we bought a company 13 times our size, which was the JWT Group. And even in the midst of that, a fairly frenetic uh, s sort of two weeks, I would talk to him five, six, seven times a day about what was going on about the business. Uh, not because he, he was a retailer, didn't have his own business, but ran the biggest retail company in the, in the country at that time, about 750 small stores around the country, but because he was very wise. And um, 
you know, I think whilst we're talking sort of sort of about mentors, men, you you really do need somebody that you can talk to, who does not have an agenda, whose interest. And you know, I knew my dad's interest was making sure that I was looked after, protected, advised, uh, thoughtful about what was going on. And so he was, you know, critically important. I mean, there's never been anybody since him. I did have a lawyer in New York, Phil Reese, who uh, died sadly of cancer, or as my father did, uh, in the early 2000s. But since then, I would say I haven't managed to find uh, anybody yet uh, within who I really can sort of talk to is incessantly. My wife now fill, fills that role more than adequately, as you know. Um, but it's really critically important, I think, to have that. Somebody you can talk dispassionately, objectively, but obviously subjectively has your interests at heart. So that mentoring is critically important. But coming back to your question, because I've rambled a bit from it, um, my education was far too narrow. I don't speak languages. My wife speaks five. Uh, I don't speak code. You know, code should be compulsory in school as a language, and maybe at least one other. I mean, the the people at uh, the boys and girls at Seven Oaks said, "What would your advice be?" One of the pieces of advice, for what it's worth, is you know you should speak code and you should you should at least have one other language. And if you said to me, "What do I think it should be?" It should be Chinese, Mandarin. So, but my education was very narrow, and I was not a great academic. I got a 2-2 at Cambridge, but I got a 2-2 in the years when a 2-2 really meant something, <laughs> right? With grade inflation, that would be at least a 2-1 now, probably a first-class <laughs> honours. Um, just touching on that point, because you're very active uh, with still with both Cambridge and Harvard, we have a debating chamber here at the conference. <laughs> One of the topics was essentially is university obsolete nowadays? A lot of people on this point feel it is. Do you, you talk about Harvard as a trade school. Is traditional university a bit obsolete nowadays for the well, 21st century? Well, I don't think it's, I don't think it's obsolete. I, you know, there is n the, the, f the five years that I had uh, from, you know, I graduated slightly earlier. I was probably a little bit under, was around 21, a little bit under 21. I graduated and then I had my two years at, uh, so at five years. You know, some if you do that joint uh, JD MBA thing at uh, Harvard, you end up being a, almost a petrol student. I think seven years or whatever it is. Um, no, it's the time in your life when you you know you have the opportunity. I mean, I don't agree with gap years. Uh, you know, my, my I have three sons. Um, none of them did gap years, not because they listened to me, because if I say go left, they go right. So, um, but I, I don't agree with gap years. I think those. From what I've seen, that 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 tends to be uh, this is a uh, sort of a, ju a judgment, maybe a wrong judgment. That tends to be wa wa wasted. But at that, no, I don't think it's obsolete. I think taking three, four, five years, whatever it is, at that stage in your life, to learn, to listen, to absorb, to develop, to think, to travel, and I think, by the way, I think it, I would almost go the other way that what I did was obsolete, it was too narrow, it was too UK focused, although I went to the US. You know, the best thing you can do is go and study in a foreign land. Uh, and so any anything that you're, you're doing, whether it, you know, if you're doing a languages course at Cambridge, which is four years now, you, you take one year and you go off, you're doing Spanish, you go off to Spain or Latin America, whatever it is, and do Spanish or Italian or whatever it happens to be. Um, no, I, I just, now what is obsolete is sort of what I would call one-dimensional education, that doing your education at that particular point in time. Uh, if you take HBS as an example, you know, there's a thing called the, what used to be called the Program for Management Development, the PMD, and the Advanced Management Program. The PMD was meant to be for sort of middle career, uh, usually it's about three months, four months, whatever it is, and then the AMP was meant to be for more mature executives around 45, 50, you know, as they go into the very senior senior levels, because there are all sorts of other. So I, I think what is obsolete in my mind, although it's not in fact, is what I would call one-dimensional education in the in the sense that you you do your primary school, you do your high school, you do your university, you do your postgraduate, and then you finish. 
that is ludicrous when you think about it because you have to continue to develop and mature and learn and there should be continuous education it should not be just a one shot and I think that's so it's more dynamic yeah. and now because of the growth of the internet you know the the internet of things internet everywhere whatever that is going to be easier to do today than it ever was when I was with your dad at B school um, we know we were starting to see the impact even in 1968 uh, you know, we would start. Ba we used to have these great big GE computers and basic programming and everything, but it was very, very basic, basic by name, basic by nature. But now, uh, and then in another five to ten years, uh, this, you know, what I'm talking about will be obsolete. And thank goodness, uh, knowledge, information will be available. I, I mean, the thing that always is seared in my memory is what Nicholas Negroponte. Uh, showed a film of uh, the pizza boxes, right? Where they took, uh, I think they were iPads in pizza boxes to a, I, I can't remember which African village it was and where it was, but the kids were like seven or eight years old. And they left the pizza bo boxes, and I don't know how they managed to power up the devices. I don't know whether it was done with solar power or whatever it was. But anyway, they just gave them the iPads or the smartphones, whatever they were, let them play with them, came back, I don't know, two months later, three months later, and they had hacked in to websites. Don't ask me how it happened. They'd hacked uh, into Are you familiar with this experiment or story? Yeah. Right, so you should all see it. So they hacked into websites and they were doing sophisticated things. These were kids at, pri not even really primary school, n very little formal education. And what that, the message where they were, you know, it, it, knowledge is distributed on a normal bell curve. It's it's been restricted to people like me and you instead of the, the, the whole population. By definition, there is a wealth of knowledge, untapped knowledge, ability, and what we're seeing is the start, and it is in its infancy, of that revolution. And it is a revolution. I mean, it's a, um, an extraordinary change. So, so I think continuous education, and and I, you know, I haven't really been back to school. Um, you could say, well, I learn things. That I could say I learn things every day, which is true. But I haven't really been back to, sp to school in a formal way, which I really should do, uh, for a long, long time. There's still time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe, maybe I will have more time. Who knows? Um, if I could just ask on. I guess the state of the media today, we've had a lot of discussions here about, the r there was a great panel yesterday on the role of the media in education policy. Now this conference exists, you're a regular at Davos, yeah. on the belief that global education as a crisis should be up there as a global issue in line with climate change or human health. But actually when it plays out in, in the media, education tends to always be a very local issue and very politicized issue. Um, it's about it often plays out as fights between unions and politicians. Yeah. One of the topics that came up is how um, we as an education community can utilize the media or should be utilizing the media all to sort of put this on the global agenda. Are conferences like this useful at all? <laughs> well, they're, they're useful because they highlight the issue. I mean, look, uh, if anybody got, got a problem, they always say, oh, it's the media's fault, right? It isn't the media's fault. It's our fault, your fault, my fault, for not engaging with them. I mean, we all have issues to deal with. And uh, let me put it like this. Somebody's going to write a minus 10 story on WPP or me or whatever it happens to be. What I found is, for what it's worth, is if you engage with the media, the chances are you can make the minus 10 a minus 8. If you don't, it's likely to turn out to be a minus 12. The, the, the reflex action, the Pavlovian reaction of any corporate executive is to duck. You know, I'm in a meeting. I'm traveling. I can't get back to you. Uh, ac accessibility, authenticity, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, why, why, 
Maybe let's get controversial for a minute. Why is Donald Trump doing so well? It could be that one of the reasons I would that he appears to be, I'm not saying he is, he appears to be more authentic than others. He's not surrounded with a coterie of advisors. He's not, I mean, some would say he's too quick to make decisions. You know, when the Pope, uh, I mean, just one little thing I thought was it quite extraordinary. I was sitting in a board meeting in New York, and on the news feed was uh, the, the, the comment that the Pope made on the plane, it was getting off on the plane or off the plane, about, you know, you should build bridges rather than walls. And I don't know whether the Pope made that comment as a throwaway line, whether it was intentional or accidental. Now, I, I sat there thinking, you know, I, I showed it to several board members, and we had a, we had a good chuckle. We thought, well, that's the end of Donald. Uh, that's what we said. No. And then I thought, well, how long would it be for Donald to react to that? And I thought, well, you know, he reacts pretty quickly, but it will take three or four hours to think about it, maybe talk to one or two advisors if he does have any, and it's not all done by him, and then he'll respond. No, straight back, straight back. Almost, into, you know, disgraceful for anybody to question my religious beliefs. And by the way, you know, a few weeks on, he won that exchange. If it was one being, being brutally frank about it, he won that exchange. You know, remember, the, the, the president President Obama had made comments a day before. So in two days, now, authenticity may be one of the things that people look for. So I, I would just, just say this, that we all get pressure from the media, but engaging is really important. And sitting there and blaming them is a weak, in my view, a weak response. They are there, they're not gonna go away. It's an era of transparency, you know, it's all out there, so you have to engage and deal with it. So turning you know, more to the central point, um, education is a critical part. I was just thinking, as you were saying, in these uh, UN Secretary General's development goals, you know, it's a fundamental part of that, you know, just as much as climate change. In any strategic plan for any country in the world, and one of the big problems is we don't have integrated, sophisticated, you know, the Chinese are much better at putting together strategic plans than we in the West are. You know, state-directed capitalism, if that's what it is, or managed capitalism, actually is much better planned in some senses. I mean, we can, you know, you can say to me, well, the Chinese are having more difficulty, true, but if you look at where they've come from it's since 1985 in Deng Xiaoping's speech, in 30 years, They've taken hundreds of millions of people out of poverty into the so-called lower middle, middle class, into urban. 50% of the Chinese population live in cities, just like the rest of the world. It will be 70%, just like the rest of the world. They are no different. And they're the second most powerful, by size, economy in the world, by size. So they've done a hell of a lot by, by planning. Now, it's not perfect, and they do have big issues to deal with. We have the same problem. We don't have plans that integrate education and education policy. And this is apple pie and motherhood. It's very, but we don't have long-range long planning. And the problem is politicians think about the short term, just like people who run companies. Your, your sort of cycle is a five-year cycle or four-year cycle or six-year cycle often limited, you can't go further than 12 years or whatever it happens to be, or two terms, or, and politicians tend after 10 years, there seems to be a 10 year tipping point. You know, people who are in power for 10 years seem to, to lose it. Uh, I mean, I don't ask me why, I don't know what it is, but after 10, 11, 12 years, they sort of seem to lose it, and many of them lose their touch and, and, and depart. But education is a key part of it, our thinking is not long-term enough, so the private sector is critically important. So you could say, well, what has WPP done? Well, we've done, we've done three things. We have three tech colleges, universities on small scale, nothing, nothing uh, scaled enough, but we've done it in China, in Shanghai. We've done it in India, 
uh, in Mumbai, and we're doing it uh, in Africa, in Cape Town, in South Africa, with a thing called the Red and Yellow School, which is art and design school. So to some extent frustrated with the inadequacies of the state system or the private system, we've said, because b we have to try and develop people who are useful for us. That has to be part of our purpose. I mean, we're, we're going to be self-interested about this. And we're self-interested because if we make an investment in education, which we are doing, in China, in India, in South Africa, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being very, you know, doing good is good business, right? Uh, John Brown said that at Stanford Business School in 1997, and he's 100%, 150% right. If you're in business for the long term, doing good is good business. This is not altruism. This is because we're self because we want the very best people in our business. That's what we're doing. And we want to train the very best people. It, it's really sort of tech school education. It's not university education to be fair. We want to take it in China, we're take we're we're applying for for our tech college to be effectively a university. We'll, we'll do the same in India, where accreditation is quite difficult. And in, in uh, South Africa, it's much more of a, a technical uh, design uh, advertising education. But uh, the answer to your question is it's a core to policy, but policy tends to be short term. You know, the UK government, I think now, we'll have a budget coming up a few days' time. It will be focused, I think, on June the 23rd and the Brexit decision, and then 2020, we know we have another election. So the Chancellor, Chancellor Osborne, is thinking about the, how the Conservative Party is positioned in 2020 for the election, not necessarily education in the context of a, a plan. So it's too short term, so the private sector has to participate. And, and I'm blunt about it, participate in a self-interested way. I'm going to open up to questions, but one last one on you mentioned the Donald, um, we ha and Brexit, and so you're talking about Donald Duck, <laughs> Donald Trump, uh, and uh, and we um, Fareed Zakaria yesterday in the opening plenary talked a lot about the rise of nationalism. Um, nationalism that, or populism? Well, he could, he termed it as nationalism. It could be populism, but maybe insularity from the. I think it's populism. I'm not sure. It's not. I don't know what the context was, but. I think it's more populism. You see it everywhere. And is that, is that, do you think, a, a change? Is that something that concerns you? Well, we had a, a panel at, uh, at uh, Davos with Niall Ferguson, the historian, Eric Cantor, uh, Don Baer, who runs uh, uh, one of our public relations companies, Bursa Marstella. Asda here is uh, involved with, as you know, with Asda Bursa Marstella with you. Um, and uh, Neil Neil talked about uh, the rise of populism. You had it before. Interestingly, he said he thought Donald would would burn out by March, and I saw him a few days ago, and he said maybe he was wrong. I think it's about the first time he's ever admitted he was wrong. But anyway, that was in private rather than public. Now it's public. Um, no, I think it's the rise of populism. I think it's 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 un I I don't agree with it, but it's understandable. Two thousand and eight and the banking crisis, the Lehman crisis, was a seminal event. It is seared in the consciousness, I believe, of corporates, still, and we're now eight years on. It is seared in the minds of the consumer. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Now, why is it that corporates have $700 uh, $7 trillion of net cash on their balance sheets with rel relatively little leverage? And the reason is, why is it that the S&P 500 in 2014 shrank? By that I mean dividend payments plus share buybacks exceeded retained earnings. I haven't seen the data for 15, but it must be available. I would bet a large sum of money that the S&P 500, thinking about it as one company, shrank again, which means it got smaller, which means there was less investment, less growth because people are just very conservative. Why is that? 2008 was a big shock to the system. Buffett said, Warren Buffett said, it was America's financial Pearl Harbor. GE was meant to be within 24 hours of being unable. This is what is said. It was, it's been subsequently denied. It was in Andrew Ross Sorkin's book, Too Big to Fail. 
that GE would be unable to refinance its commitments, its corporate commitments. Um, this, was, this was big stuff. It's very interesting that the oil price fall, which is effectively a tax cut, seems to have had very little impact on consumer spending. We have not seen consumers, because they're still repairing their balance sheet, and I believe they're still very cautious. So the rise of, and by the way, unemployment, although it seems to have fallen, is still, in my view, at relatively high levels, and youth unemployment is usually double the level of whatever, so if unemployment is 10% generally, it's 20% at the youth levels. That is catastrophic to, for today's generation and also for the generation that mature. If you don't earn your, your discounted present value, if I can put it that way, uh, of, of your life, lifelong earnings are drastically reduced if you have no job for the first five, six, seven, eight years. I mean, you know, you're, you're the stream of earnings is, is drastically reduced. So this is very serious stuff. So I, I think it's understandable in a way what happens. You know, the East Coast liberals or the West Coast liberals or liberals anywhere sort of decry Trump. I, I'm not applauding him. I'm, I'm, I'm neutral. I'm neutral. I'll take a neutral position. But what I'm saying is it's when somebody wins 30, 35, 40 percent of a poll, whether it's the Republicans or whatever, it's telling you something. You know, for example, at, at Davos, a woman put her hand up in a uh, debate and she said, I'm a fundraiser for Hillary Clinton. I live in London. I'm American. I live in London. I spend all my time having to explain to people the, the d Trump phenomenon. And then she sort of put it down. You can't put it down. It's, it's something that is, it's a trend, it's um, a feeling. And what's really interesting about Trump is he's not blue collar. He's not the disgruntled blue collar. Look at the audiences. It's white collar. It's educated people. It's uneducated people. It's wealthier people. It's middle class people. So it's, you know, it's Detroit automobile worker and much more supposedly, or service workers, manufacturing and services. It's a much more broad phenomenon. And you see it in the UK with the rise of the UK Independence Party. You see it in France with Le Pen. You see it in Spain. You see it in Portugal. You see it in Greece. You see it in Italy. It's the rise of populism. So uh, Fareed, I think, might have been talking about in a different context. But it's a really serious issue. And coming back, linking it to GEMS and education, education is a key part of it. So I want to make sure we get to open up to the floor. Does who would like to ask the first question in the front? Please. Well, you well, can take mine. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. I've got... Um, there's a great quote from Mark Twain. He said, when you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. So my question to you becomes, what beliefs do you have that run counter to received wi wisdom, or what beliefs do you have that run counter to the advice of your, the opinion of your advisors? Um, well, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, just come back. Uh, If I think about WPP, um, you know, um, it's d difficult for somebody to sort of talk about their own company or what they've been involved in. But you know, if we've had one strength, it is the b the ability to to move quickly. Okay, that that, and it comes back to sort of you said our advisors, and we do have advisors, and we do. It's not just me. We do listen to what our advisors say. And this a little bit comes back to Trump. I mean, there's a lesson in Trump. You may not agree with what he says. And you know, when you see the, the pictures this morning from Chicago, you, know, you, you start to get deeply troubled. Um, but there are some lessons there I think are really important. Um, an ability, I mean, if you think about why, why 
it, it's happening. It's happening in part, and people in the establishment come out and rail against it. But we have had paralysis in government, not just in the US and, and elsewhere, because people who had political differences and problems like education or infrastructure or technology, hardware, software, have been allowed to carry on because of political differences or personality differences or whatever. I mean, I went to the Obama uh, uh, inauguration with my wife, and and you know I was at. Uh, B I mentioned I went to the Democratic convention in '64. JFK was a hero, right? JFK was the shining light. You know, when I was at Cambridge I, on Magdalen College Bridge, I remember I met Simon Chalmers who's now a good friend of mine, uh, who's a good friend of mine then, and we were at university and school together. And I remember it still vividly on Magdalen Bridge. Simon came up to me and said the president had been shot in Dallas. Now that was a seminal moment and he was a hero for us and interestingly today it would be very interesting to see how he would have handled the media <laughs> and transparency and all that stuff uh, and Obama was to me the same thing right but here we are eight years on it hasn't unfolded the same way as as those people on the White House were watching President Bush's helicopter disappear, waving their white hankies and, and saying goodbye, and with tremendous hope. It hasn't worked out that way. And, and the system hasn't worked. There is a lot of uh, upset, uh, consternation, uh, disaffection, disgruntlement. I mean, Trump has brought people out to vote who never voted before. So. So I think what that tells you, and it comes back to to, to the thing, is that y I, I used to, and another, it was a bad quote, actually. I said, a, a bad decision on Monday is better than a good decision on Friday, which meant moving quickly, you know, whilst it has its downside, because you may make, you know, ill-considered decisions or less-considered decisions, there is something in that there. Moving quickly is really important. Surrounding yourself with batteries of advisors who say go one way, go this way, go that way, you know, it may prevent you from it. So I would say the biggest thing I is stripping out the layers, um, stripping out the, 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 the time that it takes to make decisions and moving much more quickly. And this is a, you know, a no-brainer. What do you say about the world today? It's got much faster and you have to m react you know, in the world of the web when literally in a click, information is with you in the hundred in two hundred countries around the world. You have to. So, to my mind, I see paralysis at a time when, and people falling over themselves to advise you not to do something, not to say something, not to get on with it, whereas you should get on with it. I mean, the old Nike thing, just do it. Um, you know, that may not be as far as you should go, but you know, just do it. Consider, but get on with it. Get on with it is probably better. The gentleman in the front row. Um, thank you very much. I'd love to <coughs> get your thoughts on the third word up there, employment. Um, those of us in education are, uh, one of our biggest challenges is finding good people for the classroom. Uh, and to teach. To teach. Uh, Over of our, amongst our 190,000 people is somewhere around 15 to 20 percent depending on which stage of the economic cycle you are if you know if you if think times are good it's at the higher end times are tougher frankly it's at the lower end and people often say well you know it's about financial rewards well it is in part but um, the, the simple fact is you know if you raised salaries by 10 percent in china or india it wouldn't solve the issue it has to be done culturally it has to be done intangibly and directly to your point one of the key reasons that we uh, uh, and by the way uh, uh, what's really interesting in Shanghai is the municipality called us and said we will provide you with a campus small campus facilities uh, we'll provide you with the infrastructure if you and you'll get the naming rights it's called the WPP school if you provide the curriculum, 
and the teachers. So our people teach. And it's one of the ways of getting them more engaged with us. It's one of, of cementing the bonds, right? So if there's an undersupply, uh, and our people love it, firstly creating the curriculum, and then teaching it. It gives an other, another added dimension. Now, does it solve the problem that you're talking about? No. But it means that the private sector is not just providing money, is not just providing sort of educational input in the firm terms of curriculum, but actually physical people. We're doing that in India too, same thing. And in South Africa, so the uh, same thing. So our people are intimately involved. So part of our program is to get our people engaged in teaching, not just learning themselves, but in teaching other people. It doesn't solve the problem you're talking about. It needs a, a radical overall, the same thing you could say about the, the health system and doctors. So there has to be a redirection of resource, whether it be payment, investment or whatever and it has to be part of long term plan i think the fundamental problem is i mean if you look at the the country which country comes to mind as probably one of the best plan would be singapore okay now it's true it's on a small scale it's 5 million people it's you know roughly half singaporean half from outside i think actually the proportion is slightly more expat now than which was a climactic moment when it moved that way but it's, it, why is it good? Well, it's easier because it's smaller scale, but it's heavily planned and everything is integrated. Most governments are not integrated. There's a ministry doing tourism. There's a ministry doing FDI. There's a ministry doing infrastructure. And you can see it by their communications, obviously. It's very interesting. They all do fragmented communication. They all do their own thing. They all go off in different directions. It has to be pulled together into an integrated whole. And you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, it depends on the leadership. You know, and we can argue if you have too strong a political leader, that's not good. But I, when I look at it, it's about planning, about integration, and you see it. I mean, a, the symptom of the problem is when you see fragmented communication. The, the British actually, at the moment, are doing a. I'm involved in it, uh, directly and indirectly. The Great Campaign as a communications campaign is superb. It's a common platform across the whole of government covering education, covering teaching, covering innovation, covering the creative industries, covering the financial service industry, covering the need for manufacturing. Uh, so it's integration as a whole. But I think the private sector has to, to help to do it, but government has to overhaul the levers, investment and deployment of resource in terms of, of uh, paying people better. Uh, we're almost out of time. Who would like to ask uh, a question? There in the right hand side there. Yeah, I, 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 I always look to see if it's only men asking the questions, but unfortunately it is. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, thank you, please. <laughs> Bello. Go on. Bello. Hello. Um, clearly, you've had a really fantastic kind of formative education. You've been to Harvard Business School, and you talked earlier about the need to perhaps go Some back. people would say that wasn't fantastic. <laughs> It was, wasn't formative, it was narrow, <laughs> and sort of, no, so other, some would say that. But to that point, how much of your success and your su success with your business do you feel has been down to that education? And how much do you feel has been down to your own kind of personal intuition, the networks you're able to build, uh, your decision-making skills, the kind of stuff that we see perhaps is not being taught at university? Well, look, I was extremely fortunate. <coughs> um, you know, whenever anybody writes, st and I get really irritated by this, right? They say, um, maybe a little bit less now, but uh, they used to say, um, uh, a Jewish uh, Northwest London from the ghetto in Northwest London. Huh? Um, and I used to get irritated by it because they wouldn't say somebody was a Catholic or somebody was a Protestant or something. They always used to focus on that, but maybe that was, you know, something to do. So I used to find, used to find it's less less so. But um, uh, what was formative with me actually probably was not the education. Um, 
that was a sort of catalyst. Uh, you know, it was parents. So I was a, an only child, so I'm a spoilt only child from Jewish child from Northwest <laughs> London. Uh, my mother was a typical Jewish mother. She used to wrap everything up in plastic. And uh, it was amazing that I didn't get wrapped up in plastic and, sh and put it in the fridge. I'm serious. I mean, but why did she wrap everything up in plastic? Because her parents came from Poland and uh, Romania uh, between the two wars. My father's parents came from the Ukraine in 1899. And when my mother died, um, I found uh, their wedding certificate. So I think when immigrants came at that time to the UK, and they may have been married before, I don't know. They might have been married when they were in the UK. They, they register or re-register their wedding with the births and marriage, you know, hatch, match, and dispatch um, um, uh, register. And um, so they signed their names with crosses. They didn't speak a word of English. And the four witnesses signed their names with crosses. Huh? So, and my, my father, my name is not Sorrel. My father uh, had a, a, a much more uh, Semitic name. And in the 20s, in 1924, I think he changed his name. Uh, and he changed his name to Sorrel because there was a book by Warwick Deeping uh, called Sorrel and Son, which the BBC did make into a series. If you get a chance to read it, it's quite a touching story. It's about a manservant who sends his son, looks after his son, and sends him to, to private school. I go through this because, so I was an only child, but I did have a brother who died at birth. So I was the last chance saloon, so I was even more precious to my, to my mother. So those, my father didn't have formal education. He had to leave at the age of 13. He was one of six in the family. And he had to go out and earn a living for the family. Now this is not a sob story. This is not, you know, I'm not running for president and trying to earn stripes by saying, you know, that, that I came from a poor, you know, I used to, uh, to distribute newspapers as a kid and all that stuff. I'm just giving you the background. He had a scholarship to the Royal College of Music for violin at 13 and couldn't take it up. To his dying day, he could re recite chunks of Shakespeare. You know, I used to do the English Speaking Union um, competition with Simon Sharma every year. And one of the tests you had was to do a speech. You know, you, you get a, a prose, they, they give you prose to read, you know, which you hadn't prepared, but then you could do a speech. So Henry V, Richard III, Julius Caesar, whatever it happens to be. My dad would, would go through it with me. I would always flub it. You know, when I went and did it, I, you know, I'd always, because you had to memorize it, I would always funfer at one, at one point in the time. He, he was amazing, absolutely amazing. He could recite this stuff. And I'm not talking about three or four lines. I'm talking about pages and from the Talmud too. And the reason is, in those days, if you were in the East End of London and you had nothing to do, you didn't have the internet, you didn't play video games, you didn't sit there like a couch potato, you read. So I give you this, those, those are the formative things. Now my grandfather said, my Zayda, as we call him in Yiddish, said he died when he was over 100, supposedly, we don't know when actually, when he was born. He put his hat, when he was 10 years old, uh, he had a cutlass, he was at a barricade, he used to tell this story, and a Cossack put his hand on top of the uh, barricade, and he took the sword and sliced the hand off, he would say. He didn't speak much English, it was all in Yiddish. I don't know whether these stories are true, but those, <laughs> that's the formative stuff. So the education is an embellishment, okay? And I think, and let me finish off, the, which is tender stuff, right? So I was in a debate last week with Norman Lamont. It was a private debate with 30 people about Brexit. And the Brexit debate is about economics, it's about sovereignty, and it's about immigration. Those are probably the three pillars. I think the economic debate is that we stay in. I think the sovereignty debate is that we stay in. I think the immigration debate is that we stay in. Lamont obviously has different views, and he was arguing we should come out. And I asked him at the end, with some degree of frustration, whether immigration was a net benefit to the UK economy or a net negative, de net disadvantage. He said, now he comes from the Shetlands, he said <laughs> it was a net, which is an immigrant too, he said it was a net disadvantage. That I find totally unacceptable. 
Okay? So the biggest formative thing certainly was education. It's terribly important to have great teachers. And I, I haven't said about the great teachers that I have. My economics tutor at, at, uh, at Haberdashers, my tutors at Cambridge, the, the teachers, Walt Salmon, uh, uh, the manufacturing policy course that we did at uh, Harvard. Fantastic, fantastic, big influences. But the fundamental thing is the roots, the family, the father and the mother. I mean, that's the key. That's the key. So. We're out of time. So, Martin, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>